Hey, how's it going, man? It's nice to meet you. I'm Jackson. What's your major? Oh, that's super cool, man. Yeah, that's cool. Do you have any hobbies? That's sick, dude. That's sick. Oh, what have I been doing? Um, well, you see, I, uh, I read a 620,000 word fallout slash My Little Pony fan fiction over the course of three months. Oh, why? I read a 620,000 word fallout slash My Little Pony fan fiction. Okay. So, a couple years back, I had a brilliant idea for a video. For April Fools, I was going to find a Fallout fanfiction and read it and analyze it seriously like it was a work of art. It would be a bit of self-parody, it would be fun, we'd all laugh, it would be great. So I did a bit of looking around, and eventually I stumbled across Fallout Equestria. This is a crossover fanfiction which essentially posits what if Fallout happened in My Little Pony, which was too ridiculous a premise to not do, right? I had to read that for the video until I looked at how long it was. So instead I made a short little meme video. They're pony NPCs, dude. I gotta... I'll, I'll, I'll get there eventually, I swear. Get Wi-Fi anywhere you go! Hold up. And since then, everyone has unironically been asking me to cover it. It's been essentially my top request for multiple years now, and so I caved. I did it. I read all of it. I read 620,000 words of My Little Pony fanfiction, and now you have to hear about it. This is your fault. <laughs> The crossover is a very well-treaded and well-understood trope in fiction. Here's how it works. You have your demographic, your base, your main audience, right? And you do some analysis on trends to find another property for which, if you were to cross over, both audiences would come out of that transaction larger. The idea of the crossover was at one time in history relegated to different but still similar properties. Think about different sitcoms which still share the label of sitcom, or think about how in LEGO Star Wars you can get LEGO Indiana Jones as an unlockable character. These crossovers work because their constitutive elements complement each other either in content or in recognition. If you did a crossover for two completely different things, you wouldn't be able to find an audience. There is no real audience for such a niche crossover as Doctor Who and Sonic. Nobody would- I spilled my coffee, here's the second take. There's no real audience for such a niche crossover as Warhammer 40k and Johnny Bravo. The Walking Dead and Bernie Sanders. Word Girl and JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Okay, so as it turns out in the age of the internet, everything I just spent a while telling you about is completely wrong. It doesn't matter how distinct two different properties or two different characters are, people will find a way to mash them up. Fallout Equestria is very simple. You take everything that's Fallout, Apocalypse, Raiders, Guns, and then you just shove it into My Little Pony, a show about magical pony friends who overcome adversity using the power of friendship. This is simple stuff. What isn't there to get here? Friendship, magic, ponies, nuclear apocalypse, guns and drugs. Are you stupid or something? Because the subject of today's video is in written form, it makes it a lot harder to assemble this into video form in any interesting way. So in the background behind me, you'll be seeing footage from these games. All of these are linked in the description. If any of them catch your eye, go check them out. Our story begins with an opening explaining the concept and functionality of the Pitbuck 3000 and an introduction to the fact that pretty much every Fallout gameplay idea in the book is imported into this fanfiction but with a new pun title. For example, the Pitbuck 3000 has all the functions that it does in the games. It has a compass which tells our protagonist whether nearby people are hostile or passive in universe called I forward sparkle or EFS. The protagonist has the ability to lock on to enemy targets in combat with the assistance of the stable tech assisted targeting spell or SATS. Get used to this naming convention, later on we'll find ourselves at Philadelphia Ten Pony Tower and Stalingrad. <laughs> It's all over the place, but the important part is from the get-go, this story is telling us 
that this is still very much a video game. Because this fanfiction is so dedicated to that writing style, a consequence of that is that there is a lot of filler. Especially in the first third of the story, a lot of the chapters contain within them one-off side characters, irrelevant struggles, and way too much combat. The story will go as far as to narrate the protagonist looting chests or buying equipment, not because these things are plot relevant, but more because these are things that you do in the video game Fallout 3. The entire story of Fallout Equestria when viewed from a top-down, detached sort of way is probably best described as an annotated let's play for a game that doesn't exist. Combat in the Fallout games, especially in the post-Bethesda 3D ones, is narratively satisfying only sometimes. Maybe if you're lucky you get a particularly poetic or important battle, but for the most part it's meaningless. What is narratively satisfying, for instance, about gunning down these raiders in between Prim and Nipton? It's a fun encounter. It's good to play. Would I want to read 300 to 500 words describing it in great detail? No. And that's the exact problem, because what I'm describing happens at a minimum once every chapter in Fallout Equestria, and when combat isn't truly meaningful until the final third of the story when people start to, spoilers, die, it becomes very tiring. I find that it's very difficult to portray gunfighting in a written medium if it happens this much, because if you have it happen so often, it kind of sorts to blend. There are only so many ways a gunfight can go, you know what I mean? Combat breaks out, the protagonist dives to take cover, they start firing, they get an inch away from losing their life, maybe one of their companions gets a stray bullet in the shoulder, but they narrowly beat the opposition, their raiders or generic whatever, and then they OneDrive isn't signed in, I don't care. And then they spend a while explaining how they healed themselves up and what they found on the bodies and whatever, and this happens over and over and over again. Even when they try to up the stakes by introducing a new class of enemy like a Hellhound or an Alicorn, which is this story's equivalent to a super mutant, the structure of combat remains the same, so nothing really ends up changing when you're reading it. At the end of every chapter, there's a little footnote that says that the protagonist leveled up and gained a new perk, and all of these perks are pony-themed equivalents of existing Fallout perks. Just like in the game, on occasion the protagonist will find magical bobbleheads which increase their capacity in any given area that that bobblehead applies to, and alongside the perks we're going to be filing these in a folder that will become massive labeled cute I guess. The only really negative thing I have to say about it is that it's padding, because it doesn't really remove anything, but it adds things that are superfluous. One of the most disheartening realizations I had while reading Fallout Equestria is that it's not 620,000 words because there's 620,000 words of content, it's 620,000 words because at least 20% of it is, in the box I found a gun, some bullets, and some bottle caps. Bang. Oh no, they're shooting at me again. I took out my gun and activated sats and I locked on to the three raiders in front of me and shot all of them. On their bodies I found more ammo and more bottle caps and some healing potions. So I reloaded my gun and healed myself up. Are you interested yet? Is this an interesting story to you? Do you want to read this? Something you may have noticed from my unfair half straw man there is that I was speaking from the first person, and indeed, the entirety of Fallout Equestria is told from the first person perspective of our protagonist, Little Pip. Little Pip is named Little Pip because she is in fact little and her job is to repair pit bucks. Little Pip, do you get it? Like I said, the naming is goofy. Little Pip is established as the vault outcast, the weirdo, the creep, she doesn't belong here. Little Pip is a stable dweller, stable because they're horses, and she's a pit buck technician. One day, the vault's lounge singer, Velvet Remedy, walks in and asks for a repair for her pit buck, and Little Pip is immediately starstruck. It's established that she has a crush on this character, so of course she obliges, she takes the pit buck off of Velvet Remedy's arm and starts to repair it. But oh no, this was a trick. Velvet Remedy escapes the vault, and now she doesn't have a pit buck on her arm, so the vault security can't track her or communicate with her in any way. Seeing as Little Pip believes she is responsible for this fact, she takes it on her own to go out there and find Velvet Remedy, and she too escapes the vault. 
This isn't a bad setup, actually. It is very, very much ripping off of Fallout 3, but it's quicker, and to me, it's a little more interesting. It's followed by probably the most realistic depiction of what it would actually be like for a vault dweller to leave the vault since Fallout 1, when immediately after leaving the vault, you're killed by a bunch of rats. Oh, shit! A rat! As when Little Pip leaves the vault, she is immediately captured by raiders. In this capture sequence, Little Pip is introduced to a character called Monterey Jack, who will become very important later, but for now what we can say about him is after they escape the raiders, Monterey Jack tries to rob Little Pip of all of her possessions. And this sets up the story's first real attempt at a main theme, that being that friendship and loyalty don't spend like they used to, and this tone of bleakness will carry throughout. The bleakness is probably something we should actually spend a little while talking about because probably as a result of this being a My Little Pony story, the author really wants you to take it seriously now that it's a little bit Fallout. The darker, more Fallout-inspired aspects of the story are hyper-exaggerated and twisted into becoming a flanderized parody of themselves. In this raider capture sequence, the narration calls into vivid detail the amount of blood, gore, and bodies that are present, and these graphic descriptions of violence are present throughout the entire story. Find that there are kind of two schools of thought when it comes to this kind of approach to violence in apocalypse media. Either A, you buy into the apocalypse equals hyperviolence thing. You believe that part of the reason apocalypse stories are so compelling is because they allow us to witness an environment which often necessitates the worst human being behavior has to offer in the name of survival. In these settings, human depravity can be explored deeply and thoughtfully in a way that doesn't feel cartoony because as opposed to this kind of violence in other media, that sort of thing is in a way justified. Or B, you believe that the apocalypse model is not good for its incentivization of violence, but for its efficacy at exposing the inherent violence of pre-war worlds and systems. The great apocalypse event, the bomb or the virus or whatever, exposes problems that we have in our society now, and the attempts of apocalypse characters to build up or tear down what remains can tell us a lot about ourselves that we can't really find in other kinds of media. Each of these approaches has a place in apocalypse storytelling, and indeed to an extent Fallout Equestria does engage with both in different ways. In its presentation though, Fallout Equestria does seem to embrace the former approach in the worst possible ways. While I am partial to the latter formulation of the point of apocalypse violence, I do think there are interesting things to be said and done with an approach of the necessity of violence in these situations. But rather than say or do anything with its approach, the violence in Fallout Equestria is pure aesthetics. The closest thing to a point that the moment-to-moment -moment violence has in Fallout Equestria is, aren't people ponies, yeah right, aren't ponies so messed up, isn't this so messed up guys, how could ponies do this, isn't this so messed up? The hyper-violence that is in Fallout Equestria seems like a flawed attempt to make the story more Fallout, but that's not how it comes off to me, because at least to me, that's not what Fallout is about. This is what Fallout looks like. Sure, I could give you that, but I don't think this is the point of even the most cynical and shallow games in the franchise. The violence is the paint with which a point is outlined, not the point itself, and while Fallout Equestria does have other points to make, other ideas and themes to communicate, there are too many moments where the violence sort of overshadows them. Many of my problems with our protagonist Little Pip herself come from the sense of over-exaggerated edginess. One of the things the writer clearly wants to be an endearing aspect of this character is her use of colorful swearing. Rather than, you know, being normal, she'll do the XD random thing of stringing together random curse words. You can call it a product of its time, and I think that's fair. This was very common and very funny, I guess, in the early 10s. But especially since many of these exclamations specifically reference, I personally find it grating at best. This factor makes Little Pip an annoying character, but it doesn't necessarily make her a bad character. There are annoying characters that I still think are good characters. That's perfectly fine and a valid writing choice if it's intentional. But Little Pip almost strikes zero for three there by being annoying in a way that's probably unintentional 
and on top of that, not being a well-written character either. There's criticism that I've read in multiple places online which call Little Pip a Mary Sue, a character with multiple unexplained or otherwise unearned talents and a general lack of flaws. You know, funnily enough, the term Mary Sue itself originates from another work of fanfiction, the joke Star Trek fanfiction A Trekkie's Tale from 1973. In the story, the titular character Mary Sue waltzes onto the Starship Enterprise with no training and is immediately immediately admired by everyone and accomplishes everything she sets out to do with ease. I bring this history up because I want to be crystal clear about the way that I'm using this term because a lot of the time when it's used online it's used incorrectly. The radical left wants you to believe that this woman just beat a man in a fight. You know that's not true. This woman is clearly a Mary Sue. Tucker, you know what that is so true now come over here. And kiss me mom, 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 mom. Because of this all too common use case, I was a little hesitant to bring that discussion into my video on Equestria, but there was one specific detail in a Trekkie's tale which caused me to re-examine that position. The detail is as follows. They were attacked by green androids and thrown into prison. In a moment of weakness, Lieutenant Mary Sue revealed to Mr. Spock that she too was half Vulcan. Recovering quickly, she sprung the lock with her hairpin, and they all got away back to the ship. I literally did the Leonardo DiCaprio pointing gif in real life when I saw that for the first time. You cannot believe how blown away I was. One of the major reasons people call Little Pippa Mary Sue is because throughout the entire story, she is portrayed as the only character with the physical ability to pick a lock. Her prowess at lockpicking is a key haha, utility throughout the entire story. She never meets anyone who teaches her how to do this, and she never meets anyone who's better at this than she is. From what I can surmise, this has two half explanations. In the prologue, Little Pip explains that while she was trying to find what made her special, what made her her in a coming of age way, she attempted to teach herself how to lockpick. Fine, okay, whatever. The other explanation is that her job in the vault involved picking around in small places with tiny tools, and so the skill of lockpicking kind of transferred naturally. Once again, fine, whatever. Whether you believe Little Pip earned that skill or not is kind of irrelevant because it neglects the elephant in the room, that being that this is a skill that only Little Pip has. One of Little Pip's companions throughout the entire story is a wasteland scavenger whose whole deal it is to find things and collect stuff, and he can't bust open a medical box like Little Pip can, and that's just bizarre. I didn't want to call Little Pip a Mary Sue in this video, but come on. There are a lot of moments throughout the story where the author attempts to impart a sense of moral grayness or ambiguity onto Little Pip, and to an extent I think this is a valid urge, partially because it plays into the story's already existing themes, but I think more so because, at least on paper, it makes the character a little bit more interesting than she would be otherwise. Apocalypse stories don't necessarily need moral grayness to work, and I feel like a lot of amateur writers have this problem where they believe that moral ambiguity is a must, which it isn't. One of the takes I regret most in my time working on these videos is a quite dumb critique I made in my Fallout 2 video that Frank Horgan is a weaker character than the Master specifically because the Master is more morally grey than Horgan is. And what I misunderstood is that this was kind of the entire point. You don't need moral ambiguity to make a character work. In the case of Frank Horgan, his one noteness was a part of what made him so inhuman and in turn so compelling. You don't need moral grayness to make your villains work. So it's okay sometimes to just have a big guy with a gun. Anyway, since the whole vibe that Fallout Equestria seems to be going for is dark and violent, it makes sense that they would try to make Little Pip and all the other characters a little bit morally gray. And that's fine. As mentioned, if Little Pip was everything that she is on top of being a moral paragon of perfect good, she would probably be even more annoying than she is. Where the story fails is in the delivery of this ambiguity, in particular the assignment of guilt. The story will force these moments where Little Pip is well-meaning or well-intentioned, but she suddenly goes off the rails, or she does something bad or terrible, and then she spends the next several chapters complaining and narrating about how bad of a person she is, and how bad she feels, and how terrible the situation is because of her. 
it feels very artificial when you write your stories in this way. The story is told from the first person. All that we experience is coming out of the eyes of this character, and yet it still feels like we're being told and not shown. My general disliking of this character made it especially difficult for me to empathize with any sense of grand trauma or regret that they have. It's just not compelling to me to listen to a character continually beat themselves up every chapter over events that either they couldn't foresee or they are actually right to go ahead with. The key case in the former is the case of Monterey Jack, that pony who attempted to rob Little Pip after they escaped from the raiders. Later on in the story, Little Pip finds Monterey Jack in a town and calls a guard on him to accuse him of attempted robbery, and by some strange fact of that town's legal system, attempted robbery is enough to warrant the death penalty, and Monterey Jack is killed, leaving behind orphan children. <laughs> Over the next probably dozens of chapters, Little Pip will bring up in narration how bad of a person she is for causing this to happen, which is just absurd to me. This whole situation is so easily remedied by the simple application of the phrase who could have known that every time moving forward that Little Pip brings it up, suddenly my desk magically moves itself towards my head at a rapid rate out of its own volition. It just right there. It just it's dumb. It's really dumb, and it's a very strange and artificial way of imposing a sense of self-hatred, which goes on to guide Little Pip for the rest of this story. This self-hatred, combined with a need to survive in the wasteland, leads Little Pip to the abuse of Party Time Mintals, which is this story's equivalent to Party Time Mentats from New Vegas. They make Little Pip supernaturally quick-witted and intelligent, and many of the strategies that go on to save her life are, at first, derived from the use of this drug. Addiction to this drug becomes a major struggle for Little Pip and a central piece of the story's plot and character development, and this part of the story I actually have to give genuine praise for, because the way that the story handles drug addiction is tasteful and actually kind of thoughtful, in a way that the use of drugs being a central gameplay mechanic in the Fallout games disallow them from really engaging with. Fallout 4 actually handles this a little better than the other games, what with companion reputation going up or down based on chem usage, and chem usage being a a central piece of one of the companion characters' stories. But as a whole in the series, chem addiction isn't really much more than a negative status effect that you can cleanse easily with a temporary removal chem or a visit to a doctor. The series as a whole falls short of having any serious conversation about drug use and what drugs do to people, and this is an area that Fallout Equestria, strangely enough, kind of nails. What I needed was another party time mintal. I was sure that with just a chew, the burst of reasoning and perception would solve the problem. But after the behavior of my companions, I couldn't risk them seeing me take another. They wouldn't understand. The problematic aspect of this plot point is that it kind of just becomes another Monterey Jack, in that it's just one more thing for Little Pip to incessantly whine about in her narration in a desperate attempt to convince the audience that her drug abuse makes her Satan and not just some desperate person in a rough situation who had to do drugs to cope like every other drug user on the planet. To be fair, more than likely the internal commentary I'm referencing here is not meant to convince the audience that Little Pip is right, but more so convince the audience that Little Pip is a tragic character with severe self-image issues, which is fine, but I'm sorry, I don't care. Don't care. Don't care. Still don't care. I don't care. I hate to be a suck it up guy with this stuff, but that's genuinely where I land with this character. Because the story failed to endear me to Little Pip early on, whenever she goes through struggle, I don't feel that struggle with her. How it will end up is she'll spend a hundred words talking about how bad of a person she is, and my only response will be, I don't care, quit whining, we're going to soccer practice whether you like it or not, and you better be quiet on the way home because we have food at home, we are not going to McDonald's. I don't like this character. That's it, that's the video chapter. I noticed pretty early into my reading of Fallout Equestria that this story is very, very hilariously bad at setting meaningful goals. In the beginning, the goal seems to be to find Velvet Remedy, right? That's what was set up in the intro, and at least at first, this feels like the intro and goal to Fallout 3 and 4. The difference is, in those games, this is a sort of long-term-ish goal. There are several false starts or misleads before you actually get to find the father and the father, respectively. In 3, you find your dad about a third of the way into the story, and in Fallout 4, you find Sean about a quarter of the way, depending on which faction you end up choosing 
choosing to ally yourself with, and that doesn't sound like a super long amount of time, right? A fourth of your game isn't a massive chunk of time, that's not necessarily long term in the grand scheme of things. But Followed Equestria has 45 chapters, and Velvet Remedy is found in chapter 6. That's barely more than an eighth of the way into your story, and you've already cleared your only real main goal. After Velvet Remedy is found, the story kind of doesn't know what to do with itself, it goes off the rails, and we don't get another main goal for a very long time. The only other sort of half goal that's provided comes from Watcher, who's a mysterious iBot in this fiction called SpriteBot, who tells Little Pip that in order to survive she needs to find friends, armor, weapons, and a book that will teach her how to survive in the wasteland. This vague piece of advice guides several chapters for the next little while of the story, and while I do have to give it credit that it does lead Little Pip to a location, a library where she finds the Wasteland Survival Guide, it still doesn't really feel like main quest stuff. This is still the part of the game where the quests are pushing the protagonist to go off and explore and do side content. In a game, this would be good, even great if done well. I've mentioned in previous videos how nice it is when RPGs give players room to breathe in between main missions. But this is a reading thing, not a playing thing, and it's not even like a choose your own adventure or like an I spy. There's not even any pictures. How do people read this? Until we get to the main event several chapters from now, it's just go to place, resolve that place's very specific problem, and move on. It's kind of like Fallout 1, but without the overarching goal of the water chip because, like I said, Velvet Remedy is found quickly and easily. In our meaningless trekking and wandering, we meet the story's first main major companion, that being Calamity. And Calamity is a breath of fresh air for the story because unlike every character established previously, he is fairly likable. Calamity's a wasteland scavenger with a bit of a cowboy aesthetic hat and all. His backstory doesn't get explained until far later in the story, but when it does get explored it is interesting. He has a kind of arcade ganon relationship with the Enclave, who are in this fiction a group of Pegasi supremacists who live above the clouds and control the weather. They're the reason why Equestria is permanently under this massive cloud cover, and they don't get explored until 30 chapters from now, so until then I'll just leave it there. Calamity is loyal and pragmatic and a wastelander, which means he understands what it takes to survive in the wasteland even when it isn't pretty, and this sets up a nice contrast between him and Little Pep and eventually Velvet Remedy, both of whom have very vault-like pacifist sensibilities. Speaking of Velvet though, she's not very well written. Her main personality trait is that she doesn't have a personality, and she's just whatever the plot wants her to be at any given moment. She's suave, persuasive, intolerant, abrasive, controlling. She's holier than thou. She has magic, but she never uses it. She's so many different things, but the kicker is she's only one thing at a time, and that thing is always at 110%. Velvet will have a chapter where she embodies one personality trait in its most extreme, and in the very next chapter she'll have another personality trait, and another one, and another one, and another one, and so forth. I quite liked Calamity because he was very consistent, and Velvet embodies the exact opposite of that. Velvet doesn't feel like a character because she's one note 17 notes in a row. She's a vehicle for plot and drama, rather than a person with character traits that stay relatively the same. But more excusable than that, Velvet becomes the group's doctor, she's a jazz singer and a doctor, Velvet Remedy, do you get it, 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 do you get it? So now that we roughly understand who our main three characters are and what they're up to, I'll stop beating around the bush. Let's talk about the interesting stuff. Let's talk about the world building, the lore, and the setup that makes this world, this weird mishmash of a world, work logistically. The Great War in the Fallout universe and in the world of Equestria begins for the same reason, the struggle for resources leading to tensions between two great powers. The difference is that in the mainline Fallout canon, it's very clear what this struggle for resources is a result of. It's a result of extractivism bleeding the earth dry. In Equestria, it's a lot more muddled. It's like the Great War started because of business tensions. 
The story goes like this. The zebra country has coal, Equestria has gems, each country needs the other's resources to maintain vital functions, and one day the zebra country decides to start raising the price of coal, which leads to tensions, cold war, nuclear apocalypse, whatever. It's not very well thought out, and they could have so easily just replicated the way it works in the original Fallout canon, but simply chose not to. The world of Equestria is under the joint rule of princesses Luna and Celestia, who serve their function half as ruler, half as god. It's explained that people in the vault believe that Luna and Celestia raise and lower the sun and moon, but they also have direct hands-on involvement in the things that are happening on the ground. The two are alicorns, which mean they possess all three traits of the three kinds of ponies that exist. They have horns that can do magic like unicorns, they have wings that can make them fly like pegasi, and they have the strength and hardiness of the regular ponies who lack the other two supernatural qualities. Side note, I never really understood where regular ponies fit in this world. They are very much like the Hufflepuff of this world. It's weird. Anyway, who Luna and Celestia are isn't really important for this story. What is important is what they are. They are monarchs, and as such, this inches us farther and farther away from pre-war fallout being a reflection of the ideological cold war of our world, and inches us closer and closer towards it just being a sort of battle of kingdoms like you would see in any other fantasy story. Set change, I'm in the woods, bet you didn't see that one coming. I'm getting eaten alive by mosquitoes, I don't know if my mic's good. Uh, this is the first time I've touched grass in six weeks, how are you? In the process of reading this story, what I discovered is that it feels way more like reading My Little Pony fanfiction than it does reading Fallout fanfiction. This is for several reasons, one of which I've already mentioned, that being the story's flawed relationship to the apocalypse, and to what kind of function that genre setting serves. But here, I mention it specifically because the lore of Fallout Equestria is far more Equestria than Fallout. What this means is that we spend a lot more time learning about Pinkie Pie and Twilight Sparkle than we do learning about even the most interesting Fallout factions like the Steel Rangers, the Brotherhood of Steel equivalent. While exploring the wasteland, Little Pip finds a poster for the Ministry of Morale, a big poster with Pinkie Pie's face on it which reads, Pinkie Pie is watching you forever. If you have no understanding of the show My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, it follows a group of pony friends, I can't believe I'm doing this in public, Twilight Sparkle, the magic one, Rarity, the fancy one, Pinkie Pie, the XD Waffles one, Rainbow Dash, the tomboyish one, Fluttershy, the quiet one, and Applejack, the horse girl. I get it, they're all horse girls, just please work with me. In the fiction, it's established that after the outbreak of the war, the princesses decided the best course of action was to establish several ministries, or branches of government run by each of the ponies, whose task was to respond to the war in different ways. Throughout the course of the story, we're introduced to all of these ministries, and some of them do more things than others, so we'll mention them all quickly. The Ministry of Arcane Science is a ministry run by Twilight Sparkle, the protagonist of the show, and its goal is to create magical weapons and other resources for use in the war. By contrast, the Ministry of Wartime Technology, run by Applejack, serves a very similar purpose, as the name suggests. This is the ministry out of which the Brotherhood of Steel is created, or the Steel Rangers, whatever, but other than that, it serves a very backseat role in the proceedings of things. The Ministry of Morale is the ministry run by Pinkie Pie, and it is the first ministry we're introduced to, and perhaps the most important to Little Pip herself as a character. The reason for this is that just like Little Pip, Pinkie Pie was hopped up on part-time Mintels all the time. Through an exploration of Pinkie Pie's history and experiences, Little Pip comes to understand the problems that are associated with Party Time Mintels and their abuse, especially on someone with as much weight on their shoulders as Pinkie Pie or Little Pip herself. But anyway, Pinkie Pie's ministry was responsible for the maintenance of high spirits in the homeland, but it also played a dual role as the hub for surveillance. Again, by contrast, the Ministry of Image run by Rarity is very similar but decidedly less interesting. This ministry is more directly involved in the generation of propaganda and the restricting of information, which feels like something the Ministry of Morale should already be doing with its posters and surveillance. Rarity herself is given a supporting role in essentially all of the scenes that she's in, save for a plot beat in the latter half of the story where she communes with the Necronomicon to make Harry Potter horcruxes. There are a lot of tangents that this story goes off on. Don't 
worry about this one. I'm only telling you it because it's too wild to not mention. Rainbow Dash's Ministry of Awesome is probably the strangest ministry because it only really serves to set up the lore of the Pegasus rather than do anything or establish any lore with Rainbow Dash herself. For a while, the readers led on to believe that the Ministry of Awesome is basically a joke that does nothing and that Rainbow Dash is useless until later on in the story it's revealed that Rainbow Dash was in charge of like CIA black ops, which again feels like something that the Ministry of Morale and the Ministry of Image should be also involved in. It's also revealed that the Ministry of Awesome was also making weapons for use in the war, which the Ministry of Arcane Science and the Ministry of Wartime Technology were also doing. The only two truly unique things that the Ministry of Awesome offered was that they actually fought. Rainbow Dash and her ministry fought in the war rather than just controlled it. And they also had a project to automate the control of the weather, which is a weird thing if you don't understand My Little Pony lore. In the lore, the Pegasi control the weather manually, like they push clouds into place and this machine would make sure they didn't have to do that and they could go fight or do whatever. The Ministry of Awesome is a black sheep because it really does feel like it's supposed to be like a secret grand reveal but the story tells us that they do nothing and then reveals that rather than doing anything interesting they're just doing what everyone else is also doing. Really the only cool bit about this ministry is that eventually they become the Enclave. Other than that don't worry about it. The final ministry is by far the most impactful and most interesting one, and that is the Ministry of Peace headed by Fluttershy. The purpose of this ministry was to find a diplomatic solution to the war, which is great because it works for the character of Fluttershy as this pacifist, but also works because it's not overlapping with anyone else. Everyone else is doing weapons or media control or propaganda or whatever. This is a wholly unique purpose. In the pursuit to find diplomacy, Fluttershy invents the Mega Spell, which is basically a piece of magical equipment which takes the effects of any given spell and amplifies it to a massive degree. If you have a spell that creates a small rain cloud, you load it into a Mega Spell and it creates a monsoon over the entire world. You get the picture. The original purpose of the Mega Spell and the original Mega Spell that was developed by Fluttershy is actually kind of smart because it works really well for the character and for the story. Fluttershy developed a Mega Spell that could heal all wounds within any given area up to and including near fatal ones plan with this mega spell was to deploy it in every battle. If Equestria had the technology to essentially revive everyone in every battle, every battle would end in a stalemate and eventually the two countries would be forced to come back and negotiate. They call this idea communally assured reciprocal existence, which is a rare clever moment even if it is on the nose. I couldn't really think of a more creative and better way to fit mutually assured destruction into a world of magic and ponies and friendship. Obviously this idea goes wrong, and against everyone's back and against everyone's judgment, Fluttershy descends to send this Megaspell technology to the Zebra Nation in hopes that it would be a token of good faith. The Zebras of course reverse engineer this technology immediately to use it as a weapon, and creates the bombs that destroy the world. Fluttershy's story is a much better encapsulation of the theme of good intentions gone awry than anything going on with Little Pip, because her sending the Megaspell technology to the Zebras is an action one could easily have assumed would go wrong, rather than a fluke or an accident or a deserved act of violence. There is a reason that Fluttershy decided to go behind everyone's backs in this action, because everyone rightfully would have called her out on it and said this is a terrible idea. But because of her pure intent and kindness, Fluttershy herself could not see that, and let her idealism get ahead of her as she doomed the world to nuclear apocalypse. The stories of these original ponies are told partially through the use of environmental storytelling, like the Pinkie Pie posters, but more so through the use of memory orbs, which is one of the few original developments that Followed Equestria brings to the mechanics side of things. A memory orb is a magical item that removes and stores a person's memories to be replayed later into the future. They're basically an in-universe way for allowing for flashbacks, as well as a way to import Fallout's audio logs and terminal entries into the written medium. Most of what we learn about the pre-war of this story comes from these memory orbs, and the scenes within the orbs are generally very well written and actually better than the scenes out of the orbs. And I, I have to say it, I have to be a dick, a large reason for why this is is because Little Pip is pushed to the side a little bit. We still read her thoughts as she's going through it, but there is far less Little Pip narration and far more dialogue between the much better written Ministry Mares. 
the other major reason the memory orbs are so good is because they're very focused. They tell quick, relevant stories about what happened pre-war in order to stop the bombs or eventually survive them, and there's very little combat for me to roll my eyes back into my head during. The stories of the Ministry Mares provide yet another giant signpost pointed at two of the main themes of the story, the first of which we've already gone over. These are the ponies from the show, they were so kind and wholesome, and now their good intentions are causing or worsening the coming apocalypse, good intentions gone awry. The second is, of course, the more My Little Pony oriented theme of togetherness. One of the reasons the story provides to account for the ministry's failings is that due to each pony running a different ministry, they were all split up and thus weaker. The individual flaws of each of these characters shun through more strongly in absence of the others to make up for those flaws. This is fine, but it still doesn't make up for the fact that all of the ministries intersect at like 15 different points. Why are they torn apart? They should be working together, yada, 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 yada. I'm at a really tough spot when trying to elaborate my feelings about the lore for this story because it's probably one of my favorite aspects of the whole thing, and yet it still falls flat in so many key areas. So my discussion of it may seem like it's so great and phenomenal when compared to everything else, but if you put this in, anything that was competent as a whole product, it would be bad. But praise where it's due, it was better than the rest of it. After Watcher leads Little Pip to finding Calamity and eventually Velvet Remedy and the group go off and they do all their raider side quests and they traipse around doing nothing for a while, they get a distress call on the radio from one DJ Pwn3 telling of a security officer who's trying to kill several ghouls attempting to enter Ten Pony Tower. This plot beat is one to one mirroring Fallout 3 in most aspects. Ten Pony Tower is everything that Ten Penny Tower is in that game, but it's also Galaxy News Radio on top of everything. We discover that DJ Pwn3 is a title, not a person, and the current holder of the title of DJ Pwn3 is a mare named Homage who pitches her voice down to sound like the DJ Pwn3s of the past. This character is a pretty direct reference to Three Dog, and as such, they follow all of Three Dog's pros and cons as a character. The DJ Pwn3 broadcasts are stylish and informative, but they also overly honor and revere their protagonist to a detrimental degree. It actually makes a little more sense in Equestria than 3 though, because throughout the story, Homage and Little Pip have a sort of romance plot going on that's at best described as weird and at worst described as gross. And if you want to hear more about that, I've locked it behind the Patreon because it's not something I feel comfortable discussing publicly and it would probably get this video demonetized, so next! Moving into the factions now, we get a bit of a palate cleanser as I get to talk about stuff that I actually do like. During the course of their travels, the gang is saved by Steel Hooves, who is a stoic Steel Ranger, the representative for this universe's Brotherhood of Steel. The Steel Rangers are well explained, well characterized, and well developed, and have a unique twist to the Brotherhood of the games. Steel Hooves is a unique, interesting, and lore-heavy character who is dynamic. He changes and grows as a person throughout the story in a way that feels actually earned. The Steel Rangers are a faction born out of the Ministry of Wartime Technology under Applejack, and they serve a very similar purpose to that which we see in Fallout 1 and Fallout New Vegas. They hoard technology and they're not nice to outsiders. They have sketchy leadership and there's a lot of internal tension about where they're at versus what the original tenets of their faction say they should be. Steel Hooves at the beginning of this story reflects all of this. He's cold and he's violent, but as he travels with the party, he comes to understand that sometimes it's okay to let your guard down. This idea is especially hard for Steel Hooves, as we come to learn that he is a ghoul from the pre-war who was in love with Applejack. Steel Hooves' story is tragic, and as a reader, it's very easy to empathize with him. What pushes Steel Hooves' character from good to great is how his change as a person informs his leadership of his faction. Steel Hooves begins to question the purpose and methods of the original Brotherhood, and believes that maybe the Brotherhood's resources could be used to actually make the Wasteland a better place and help people. So, he creates the new Brotherhood Exiles. Do you see what this is doing? This is actually probably the smartest thing the story does in the entire thing. It's flipping the Fallout 3 Brotherhood Exiles on their head, twisting them in such a way that they make more sense in this fanfiction than they do in the original text. 
rather than the main brotherhood being unorthodox and goody two-shoes and the exiles being more traditional, the existence of the exiles is both informed by plot and character developments, and it also is just more sensical from the lore perspective. The exiles in 3 being basically counter-revolutionaries never sat well with me, they're exiles from what are essentially exiles. Anyway, the brotherhood stuff is great, and every scene in the story with Steel Hooves is my favorite scene. Throughout the story, Velvet Remedy kind of idolizes Fluttershy despite the fact that she caused the nuclear war, and later on in the story a character calls her on that. They say, why do you love this person so much when they caused the end of the world? And that interaction goes like this. So you follow the pony who all the medical supply boxes are made to look like? Yes, Velvet Remedy stated, beginning to get her hooves back under her. Her name is Fluttershy, and she was the best pony. Cage considered that. But you said she was the one who created the mega spells. Velvet Remedy had been surprisingly forthcoming with that bit of information, a reaction I suspected to our attempts to keep it a secret. Which caused the apocalypse, Cage added. So, you're a follower of the apocalypse? I don't even have to say anything, man. Throughout the story, there are these radio transmissions we hear on the radio and on iBots coming from a character called Red Eye, who will become the story's first major antagonist. Red Eye's whole deal is that he's a charismatic ideologue who's trying to build a new, better world on the backs of slaves. Red Eye doesn't like his own slavery, but he justifies it by saying that all of his slaves are fed, they're housed, and they get to contribute to something greater than themselves rather than just dying in the dirt. Red Eye is a fairly compelling character because his motivations match his actions, which is something very rare for this story. He genuinely does want to build a better world, create a society out of what's essentially rubble, but he believes that people who think that it won't take suffering to get there are naive. He's building his grand nation on the backs of slaves for this very reason. His violence and cruelty towards his slaves is not coming out of some sadism a la raiders, but from a genuine belief that this is how you build the workforce required to do the work that is needed. He creates tough workers to do tough work towards a tough goal in a tough world. Red Eye is one of the few characters in the story who genuinely does make sense. Red Eye's character almost becomes worse by proxy when he introduces the story's second antagonist. Red Eye wants Little Pip to take over his station and kill a character called the Goddess, whose station he will assume. In doing this, Red Eye will become a benevolent, ultra-powerful being, and Little Pip will manage things on the ground in the new world that they will both create. Now, who exactly is the Goddess? That's where the trouble starts. And we're back. Speaking of back, the back end of this fanfiction is stuffed with antagonists to a detrimental degree. That was improv. I bet you laughed. You laugh, right? Uh, leave a comment if you laughed at that joke I just did. So anyway, the first half of the story is very open and empty, and then in the second half they shove in all of these antagonists. They shove in Red Eye, they shove in the Enclave, and they shove in an analog character for the Master called the Goddess. This character is a product of the experiments done by the Ministry of Arcane Science. It was an experiment to turn a pony into an alicorn, a la the goddesses Luna and Celestia. Test subject falls into a vat, uh, multiple personalities, psychic powers, all the master stuff. The goddess wants Red Eye dead, and Red Eye wants the goddess dead, so Little Pip does both and blows up the goddess's base at Maripony, haha, ha, get it, with a nuke, I mean mega spell oh shit. This character isn't really interesting in any meaningful way because unlike the master, she doesn't have a perspective. The master isn't a good character because he's scary and big and can do telepathy. The master is an interesting character because he serves to communicate one half of the dialogue that the game wants you to have with yourself through the entire story. Is humanity worth saving? Yes or no? The master says no. You see a whole bunch of different examples from one side or the other side of this discussion throughout the entire game, and at the end you make your big decision. That is Fallout 1, that's why that game works, that's why the master works. In Equestria, the goddess vaguely gestures at this master-like point, but it's so surrounded with I am going to rule the world because I am all-knowing, <laughs> that it kind of just doesn't work. The final major antagonist is the Enclave, the latest to enter the story and the final antagonist of the piece. The Enclave are in an interesting position because they are so poorly exposited, yet they're so important and they come in so quickly. They come in very quick and they occupy so much space, but we know so little about them. 
The little exposition that we do get comes from Calamity, who used to be a member of the faction, and he explains a few things. They used to be the Ministry of Awesome, and they are a faction of Pegasi who live in the clouds in a democratic society. They keep Equestria dark, as I mentioned, and they have a sort of fascist relationship to the military and the family. It's, as far as we know, a very good representation of the Enclave from the games for this setting, but I can't really say that with any certainty, can I? It's a question of whether the Enclave are good because they're good, or whether the Enclave are good because the writer didn't spend enough time on them to mess them up. We never really get to meet the everyday citizen of the Enclave. The only Enclave we meet are Calamity as an ex-Enclave member, and several Enclave leaders and very, very pissed off Enclave soldiers. It's a real shame that this wasn't a more prominent part of the story and the writer didn't spend more time on them, or maybe it isn't a shame at all because I don't know how much more of this I could take, so let's just wrap it up. The ending of the story is controversial because the ending follows a trope which is in itself controversial, that being the ending where the protagonist sacrifices themselves for their greater good. The Enclave, through Rainbow Dash's efforts pre-war, has a sort of machine that a pony can integrate with to autonomously control the weather themselves, rather than having to rely on the goddesses or the strength of the pegasi moving the clouds physically or whatever. So Little Pit puts herself into this machine and is sort of stuck forever in a half-death, half-sacrifice, technically alive but unable to live. With the weather under her control, the Enclave no longer have their massive sky cities, and there is sunshine in Equestria and all things are well. The major problem with this ending is a critique that's ripped straight from Plentitude's massive Google document critique of Fallout Equestria, link in the description. The story is largely about how the road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? How heroic actions can have unintended negative effects. But in this final action, in this heroic noble sacrifice, Little Pip does an unambiguously good thing with good intentions and it's a heroic act, and it's just that. It's sad, sure, it's bittersweet, fine, but it's a good action with good consequences. The road to salvation is paved with the same intentions as the road to hell, I guess. This plot beat renders the entire story kind of incoherent or at best messy. Reading this fanfiction over the last three months has been an experience very similar to the work itself. I read it in class, I read it at the gym in audiobook form and at work, and throughout the entire experience it's been uncoordinated, it's been messy, at times it's been painful, and at times it's been actually kind of interesting. Now the main question becomes, would I recommend that you read this? If you're a fan of My Little Pony and Fallout and you somehow haven't read it already, I would say absolutely yes. This was made for you. This is your thing. This You are the core demographic for this. Go do it. Go read the fanfiction. See if you like it. If you're watching this and you're somehow just a fan of My Little Pony, probably you too. You're good to go read it. That's probably fine. Maybe you'll like it. If you're a fan of just Fallout, that answer becomes suddenly a lot more complicated. There is seriously a lot to get here if you view it from a detached academic level. There's a lot to learn about fandom and storytelling. And I'll be real, at small times throughout the story, peppered in, there are actually seriously interesting and good things here. But for the most part, I'll be real, should you read this if you're just a fan of Fallout? Nah. No, probably you shouldn't. Probably it would be a mistake to do this for three months. I know way more now about My Little Pony than I ever wanted to or ever will have any use for now, but at least I'm done. At least I'm done. I did it. I can say I did it. At least there's no more. There's no, there's no more. There's no more. There's no more to read. All right, cool. Uh, that's it. New California next. No more ponies for a while. We're back to business. It's only serious videos now. It's only it's only serious business. We're only going to serious work. We're making serious videos about mods. We're making we're making really serious serious videos. Serious time. <laughs> patrons, patrons, thank you for giving me money. Yeah. Thank you too. Adam Souza, Holly Jenka, It's Ducktastic, Jack Bradley, Oliver Vickman, Ryan Little, Ride, Spritz, Talia Hemke, and Zachary Shannon. Yeah! If you want videos, early scripts, behind the scenes, all this stuff, go to Patreon.TheThingRamble. I'm go. Bye!